Well, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and I want to use a third one. Okay. <laughs> Who here grew up not in North Dakota? Okay, a few of you. Have you ever made maple syrup? Oh, one. Where'd you grow up? Wisconsin. Big maple syrup production there, yes. Anybody else? Nope. Anybody, any native North Dakotans here make maple syrup? Because I know there's a few out there. No. So this is something really unique for North Dakota. And just to give you a little background about myself, uh, I grew up in Ohio. That's me at age five with the first tree I ever planted. That is a golf ball tree for those of you who uh, weren't familiar with that. Let's see, does this go? Oh, for, oh perfect. Uh, oh, now where I grew up is very interesting as because the forest has a lot of sugar maple trees in it. Sugar maples where we get the sap for maple syrup and uh, we had the, the maple festival every year growing up and this year I'm going to celebrate the 48th anniversary of my sister being the maple queen and my <laughs> oldest sister. So I'm going to give her a lot of grief this year and say that was 48 years ago. Wow. And she's going to get really mad at me for pointing out her age. But when I was a kid, we would do this. We would maple sugar in the spring between us and the neighbors. We had, we had an acre and a half, they had an acre and a half, and then there was an acre and a half between us. And it kept you know, six kids in our family, three kids in their family. It kept us busy in the spring, kept us out of trouble. Uh, you know, We made enough maple syrup to keep us happy and we'd have a pancake feed at the end of it all. But uh, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of production. How do you do it? How do you make maple syrup? Well. <clears throat> Very briefly, three steps. You collect sap in the spring on the, when the days are above freezing and the nights are below freezing. That's the key for the maple sap to run. Okay, and it, if, you, if it was like 31 overnight and 33 during the day, it's not going to really run a whole lot. It's going to be more like about 28 up to 38 or 40. Then there's going to be a good sap run. So you would collect sap in the, in the day, and we got a very narrow window. In the spring, it's about four to six weeks. Uh, it's really interesting, my wife and I were talking on the drive here yesterday, she says, you're making maple syrup this year, or going to make maple syrup, are you a farmer? I had to think about that, I said no, producer, producer. So I think about the farms and the ranches here and how things are very seasonal and you got a narrow window of when it's time to plant, when it's time to harvest, whatever, you go, you go and you got that window and that's it. It's the same with maple syrup production. Um, I got some interesting data from Chad Troutman at, at uh, Fort Stevenson State Park. Uh, who's been to Fort Stevenson? Okay, yeah, me too. By the way, they're going to have their maple syrup or their maple, maple days in the second Saturday of April. I hope you all go. He's been doing this since 2015, and he's been, he does this with box elder trees. We'll come back to that in a minute. He does this with box elder trees, which are maples, collects the sap, and this is the uh, dates of the first sap run, the last collection, as well as how many, and, and I kind of added how many days that is. So it's really interesting. It varies from year to year. When was the first sap run in 2020? It was the last day of February. Oh, the 29th. I looked at that and went, wait a minute. February has 28 days. Wait, 2020? That's OK. All right. Um, compare 2016 to 2018. 2016, it was done by April 11th. 2018, they didn't start till April 11th. So we've got this window of you know, like I said, four to six weeks, but when you're actually down to it, whatever year it is, it's about three or three and a half weeks is how much you're uh, going to be out there doing it. And I found this, the, the uh, shortest year was 2018, two weeks. That was it. It was done. We went from winter to summer, and that was it. Okay, uh, back into 2020, the first one, February 29th, and then for the next 51 days, Wow, that's crazy. That's insane. So anyway, it's about 26 to 28 days. You've got this window, three and a half, maybe four weeks, where you're collecting sap in the spring. So you collect sap, 
and you stop when trees break bud. Once the trees start breaking bud and the leaves start to grow, the trees are done. They're not going to uh, send out any more sap. And even if they do, it's, you know, there's, it's minimal. It's not very good. You take the sap. The sap is sugary water. And you concentrate it. How do you concentrate? Well, um, oh, and then you package it. So those are the three steps. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but We'll come back to that, because I wanted to point out, what trees do you usually do this with? OK, where I grew up is sugar maple. You can do it with box elder. Box elder is a maple tree, also called Manitoba maple. Has anybody ever had maple syrup that they know came from box elder trees? OK. Was it good? Yeah, absolutely. I have too. It's, it's good stuff. Um, and there are you can make maple syrup from other maple trees like silver maple, but let's just point out, by the way, sugar maple is not native to North Dakota. How do you tell a sugar maple? Now, Greg, you know this one, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, you look for pointy buds. The pointy buds are like ice cream cones, okay? You ever have an ice cream cone with a pointy cone? It's called a sugar cone. Sugar cone, sugar maple. Ah. Ah, a little trick there. Okay. See what I did there? Yeah. Okay. Look for the pointy buds. You can feel it. All right. Um, sugar maple, the, the seeds are very uh, interesting. They point down a little bit. Uh, we'll come back to that. Not native to North Dakota. I'd say it does so-so here. Now, there are some horticultural uh, cultivars, some ornamental cultivars that do better than others. And I am going to ask Greg, uh, now, I work out of Fargo. Greg used to work out of Fargo. He lives in here in Bismarck. Which is the better environment for sugar maple, Fargo or Bismarck? Bismarck. Bismarck. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, Fargo, the, that heavy clay soil is just, sugar maples grow for about 25 years and then they kind of go, um, I think Bismarck is a better place for that. Now, there's the native range of sugar maple trees, as Greg pointed out. They are in South Dakota. There's a little green dot there for North Dakota, and I'm, I don't believe it, personally. Um, but it's called Sitchi Hollow down in South Dakota. Has anybody ever been there? It's, it's in the Sisseton Hills there. Beautiful place, and there is a sugar maple forest in the middle of, well, not the middle of the prairie, because it is in this forested area that's got a little more moisture. It's kind of interesting, very unique. OK. Box elder, Manitoba maple, this is what we have here. And how do you tell a box elder tree? Oh, they grow everywhere. Um, what, what we're looking for is this white, purple, blue, glaucous twig. Glaucous, it has a bloom on it. It's like a wax. And sometimes, sometimes the growth is you know, only a foot, sometimes it's two or three feet. It's pretty amazing how fast these things grow. Uh, there's opposite branching. The branches are opposite of each other, not alternate. I like doing that little move there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and they are a compound leaf with a bunch of different leaflets. The bud is way back there. And this is, uh, they, they grow everywhere. They can grow in town, they grow out of town. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend them, I don't recommend them as an ornamental because structurally, uh, it's, they're not the greatest strength tree. But, okay, uh, and they have separate female, male and female trees. The females hold their seeds well into winter. Here's the thing though, box elder trees, unless you work with them all the time, sometimes you could confuse the bark from a box elder for a green ash. A lot of people do that. I would say, I've never done that <laughs> once. Okay, well, maybe more than once. Um, it's a little bit tough. So if you're going to tap a tree, make sure it's a box elder and not a green ash. You'd be surprised. Okay. Uh, box elder grows coast to coast. It grows anywhere in North Dakota, uh, south from Mexico, well into Canada. It's a pretty amazing tree. Silver maple, which we often plant here as an ornamental, you can make maple syrup from it. Um, Personally, I've never done it. I've never tasted it. Some people say, say that it has a vanilla uh, flavor to it, if you can taste that in your maple syrup. I have a hard time distinguishing flavors in maple syrup and other syrups because 
mostly what I get is sugar. Uh, I don't have the, the most uh, discriminating palate. It's all, it's all good to me. Sure, silver maple, the, we see these, the bark peels in these long strips. Uh, the trees grow really fast. It's pretty amazing. As Greg mentioned before, though, the, they're one of the parents of those Freeman maples. They can suffer from iron chlorosis here in North Dakota. So we may or may not see them around here. How much sugar is in the sap? Okay, well, they all range from about 2 to 6%, depending uh, which you look at, uh, you know, which scientific publication you look at. Sugar maple is usually considered to have the most sugar, but any individual tree might be higher or lower than others. It's, it's pretty amazing what we find. 3% or more is pretty common in sugar maple. There have been some breeding pre programs over the years where they're trying to breed super sweets, and there's been some success with that. Um, again, going to Fort Stevenson right up here with box elder, this was kind of interesting. How, how sugary is that sap? Well, in these six years, sorry, seven, no, six years uh, of data, wow, anywhere from about 2.1% up to 3.1%. That's pretty good. That's really good. Okay, so you want to collect the sap. How do you do that? Okay, um, or wait, let me back up. Sorry, I, I'm, looking, I'm looking back here. It's interesting. I can see my slide back there. Went, oh, yeah, that's the tap. Wait, look at the bifocals. No, that is a refractometer. Anybody ever use a refractometer? What would you use it for? Antifreeze. Antifreeze. Okay, sure. Anybody else? Bricks. Bricks. What's bricks? Sugar content. Sugar content. What, what did you use that on? Uh, garden vegetables. Garden vegetables. Okay, yeah. Some people use them for honey. Some people have used them for grapes. You can use them for sugar. And uh, it's funny, I, I was talking to my wife here today. I said, oh, yeah, these are like 60 bucks. She says, well, that's not what I saw online or, you know, over at Fleet Farm. You can get them for 15 bucks. And so I looked online and, oh yeah, they're really variable. You can get a really cheap one for 15 bucks online. Uh, or you can spend $450. Good luck with that. Okay, there's lots of variability. Measure the sugar content of your trees. Because if you have a tree that's really low sugar content, eh, you're going to spend a lot of time for not a whole lot of reward. Try to get the ones that have the higher sugar content. And it does vary from one tree to the next. Right. So how do you collect the sap? You drill a hole in the tree. Doesn't that wound it? Yes, it does. But people have been doing it for years. So when, when I was young, we would go out with the old uh, brace, you know, hand drill, and we'd use this ship auger bit, and we'd sit there and we'd lean into it and just start turning and cranking. And you know, nowadays, um, you get a good carbide bit and you know, your drill. Your, electric, or your cordless drill works just fine. Uh, I will say you do want to go at a slow speed. If you set that drill too fast, you will, uh, you'll clean out the inside of that hole, you'll shine it up, and it'll actually block the, the sap from flowing. So go nice and slow. Want a rough inside to that. And at a slight upward angle so the sap drips out. Some people say when they're pruning trees in the spring, and they see this moisture dripping out, whether it's a sugar maple, any maple, or birch trees. Say, oh, my tree is bleeding. It's not blood, okay? It's not blood. It is sap. It is water that comes up from the soil. The sugar that's inside the tree, stored in the tree, dissolves in that water, and it comes out. So we're, it's not blood. Okay, can you over tap a tree? Oh yeah, you can. So the, we got to do this within some limits, and we'll talk about that. Um, basically, you know, Tom said he likes to measure the diameter of the tree about ankle height for those uh, for those apple trees. For the the larger trees, we measure it at chest height, four and a half feet. Okay, and if it's from about 12 inches to about 18 inches in diameter at four and a half feet, put one tap per year. That's it. If it's over 18, you can put two. Now, where I grew up, there were some trees that were this big, and they would put three 
taps on the tree, and you could do that with a huge tree, but we don't have to worry about that. Uh, now, modern day, what do you do? You drill a hole. Now what do you do? You've got to collect the sap. You put in what's called a spile. And a spile is just, <clears throat> excuse me, spiles, uh, hard plastic, metal. It's a tube that allows that you to direct that sap that's dripping out. And spiles, uh, in the old days, again, traditionally, uh, you'd put some type of, well, that metal one there on the right, that's what we used growing up. You'd, you'd pound that into the tree with a hammer. Okay, and then now there's plastic ones, and then you'd hang a bucket on that. And if you want to go really, really traditional, you could get out there and whittle them. I don't know anybody who's done that. Um, although, anybody know Jeff Miller out of Cass County? Yeah, you guys might know him, yeah. I think he might try that. Jeff's a real Renaissance guy. Okay. Um, so you, you drill a hole, you put the spile in to direct the, ta the sap, and then what do you do? Well, the old days we'd hang a bucket on it. Nowadays there's a plastic tube, and it goes into a bucket that's sitting on the ground. This is actually my, bo my brother's place, and uh, he's got two on that tree. And he, just, he actually finished about a week ago. Uh, he lives in Ohio, and it's just pretty crazy. He's already done. Yeah, we haven't even started. So. You can do that. Uh, commercial operation, this is out by us. Uh, Jake's Maple Syrup, or Jake's Syrups and Natural Products. They've got 40 acres of trees, and they've got hills, so they just put these lines out there, and it goes from tr one tree to the, that trunk line, the next tree goes to that trunk line, the next tree, and these lines collect all that sap at the bottom of the hill. And then they use a pump to pump it up the hill. So it works pretty good for them. They've been doing this for many years. And uh, they just put it in a big old garbage can. Now, the, I believe, I was looking at this, I was told the, if it says brute on it, it's, if it says brute, it is food grade. I didn't know that, so I learned something new. All right, and, and with these guys, this is a commercial operation, so it's pretty big. Uh, they've got, you know, the, they've got huge tanks there, they've got the four-wheeler with the tank on the back and they could haul it up the hill or they can put, uh, pump it up the hill. Pretty big project. Okay, so we collected all this sap. Great, now what do we do? We have to concentrate the sugar. We've got 40 gallons, 50 gallons, 100 gallons of sugar water. Now what do you do? Okay, sap's coming out of the tree somewhere between two and 6%. Uh, when it's syrup, it's about 67%. I say about because there's some rules and regulations, eh, 66 to about 69 percent, depending uh, of who you're talking to. But it's about 67 percent. That's two-thirds sugar. Wow, that's great stuff. I love it. Oh yeah, that's right. So a couple of weeks ago, we had some neighbors over, and I cooked dinner. I made chili, and I made some cornbread. And whenever I make cornbread, I always put in a little bit of maple syrup. Yeah, and I also took a shot for myself. It was great. <laughs> Just like a kid. And traditionally, what do you do? How do you get the, the water out? Boil, boil, boil. You heat it up and you uh, boil it a lot. So this is a guy out of Bismarck here, Jesse Kist. What he does is he puts a pan of 2% sugar water on to this homemade little boiler he built. It actually works pretty good. And he just keeps pouring in more sap, boiling it off, pours in more, boils it off. Um, my brother does this. You know, he's got a propane grill there, and he's got a pot on there, and he boils it off and adds more and boils it off. Uh, the folks who are doing it commercially, oh, sorry, going back. So my brother gets it close outside, and then he brings it inside. He does his finish boiling on the kitchen stove. It takes a lot of energy to boil that water. Okay. The folks who are doing it commercially, what they do is they've got a system like this, it's called uh, continuous or feed processing, and it starts at the back of the pan at 2%, and it winds its way around, and water's coming off, steam is coming off, and by the time this river of sap is done working its way through the system, by the end of that, it's 67% sugar. And they just you know, open a valve at the bottom and draw it off, and they've got maple syrup. 
It's pretty cool. Okay, modern, uh, modern maple syrup processing, they've really gotten into reverse osmosis. Who here has a reverse osmosis for their drinking water at home? Just us? Oh, you guys must have really good water. Good for you. Okay. Uh, reverse osmosis works really well. It puts pressure uh, through a filter, through a membrane, pushes uh, water through. And this is, again, a commercial operation at, over at Jake's Maple Syrup. I think this thing cost them like 12 grand. Um, I actually spent $300 this summer and I got a bucket. <laughs> All right. Sorry, dear. No. This is a reverse osmosis system in a bucket, RO in a bucket. And everything is in there. The pump is in there, the filter's in there, the lines are in there. And that is going to turn that sugar, that two to 6% sugar, it's gonna concentrate it to somewhere around eight to 15% sugar. Okay, who here remembers chemistry class? V1, C1 equals V2, C2. Volume one, concentration one equals volume two, concentration two. If I got rid of half the water, I've doubled the concentration of sugar. Oh, oh, well that's pretty good. Saves hours of time, hours of time. Um, you can cut the time in half or even less, or you know, you can cut it by half or even more. I'll put it that way. My brother, again, he got an RO in a bucket from his kids for Christmas. I said, good job, kids. Uh, and, and, I, and he did this, and he ran about 30 gallons through, and it went from, he did it for about five hours, and he, he told me the percent uh, that he got it down up to, and I said, you've cut your boiling time by 70%. You know, instead of boiling for, for five hours, you know, you're gonna boil for an hour and a half. That's great, that's really good. Wow, save a lot of time that way. So again, you're going from about 3% sugar up to about 67% sugar, uh, but, you know, we're not gonna measure the bricks on the syrup, we usually don't. What we usually do is use a, a thermometer and you measure the boiling point. And when it hits seven degrees above the boiling point of water, that's when you know you've got maple syrup. Okay, uh, who here has used a jelly thermometer or a candy thermometer? Yeah, okay, all right. So it's got the different temperatures on there for the gelling point and other characteristics. But you have to calibrate the thermometer to see what the boiling point of water is where you are. It's part of, sometimes it's, um, well, sometimes the thermometer itself is calibrated wrong. Sometimes it's elevation, sometimes other characteristics. So, whoops. So my brother's talking here and I probably won't be able to hear him, but that's what he's saying. Um, I had to transcribe this today. <laughs> okay, getting, yeah, if you hear me read this, you'll basically hear my brother's voice. We sound the same. Um, where he is, usually it's 210 degrees. That's his thermometer. You know, what's water boil at? 212. Uh, except where he is, it's 210 with that thermometer. So back when he sent me this video, it was actually 211. So he was calibrating, he calibrated his thermometer and he was getting close. And the other thing is, it gets really small bubbles. When I was in college, in graduate school, uh, the forestry students there at Michigan State, we, would, we had permission to make maple syrup for ourselves on one of the farm woodlots. It was really cool, it was back of the dairy farm. Um, we'd do about 50, 60 trees every year. It's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun because, you know, the students are out having a bonfire at night out in the woods. Yeah, we were weird that way. Okay, uh, really small bubbles. That's how we could tell we were getting close. If you want to get really technical, you can measure the density of the water or density of the syrup using a hydrometer. And I don't know how much these cost because I don't want to get that technical. And then you package it and you store it, you, you filter it. How do you filter uh, a liquid? Uh, you can use a, a bunch of different things. You know, this is my brother's setup, the joy of PVC. Good job, PVC and uh, clothespins. He did a good job there. Uh, I've, uh, when I was younger, we always used cheesecloth. 
cheesecloth through a sieve. That works just fine. And commercially, these guys use a filter press. Uh, they push it through with pressure, and it filters out bug parts that maybe a bug got in there. Uh, it filters out sometimes uh, sugar sand. There's some, you know, some calcium crystals that form. They can get rid of that that way. And there's a whole bunch of options with bottles. Uh, if you're going to do this commercially, uh, we always use the, the clear glass or the glass ones. That was fun. Um, if you're going to do this commercially, it has to say pure maple syrup, at least in the US. And uh, Canadian labeling rules, I don't know what they are, uh, but it has to say pure maple syrup. I, I went to the store. I stopped at Dan's before coming here, bought a couple bottles of maple syrup. They're going to be given away tonight. Uh, I couldn't give you any. I haven't made any yet. Sorry. It's still too early. And I, I went for this one jar, and it said maple syrup. It said big, big letters, maple. Maple flavored syrup. Like, ah, you got to be kidding me. Like, hey, this is a good price. It's because it's fake. It's corn syrup that's been flavored. OK, I was a little disappointed. So maple syrup. This is what my brother does. Uh, you got to package it while it's hot. Uh, you know, ever do this with your jelly jars or your pickle jars? Yeah, we, that's what we do too. Um, package it hot and store it in a cool area away from sunlight. Okay. And if it's open, put it in the fridge for up to a year. That's fine. It'll really keep. Not a lot grows inside something that's 67% sugar. It's really hard for things to grow. Um, sometimes you'll see sugar crystals at the bottom of the, the jar. That's fine. Bottom of the bottle. That's fine. It's just, you know, it's too much sugar. It's just recrystallizing. It's lots of fun. So how good is the syrup? You know, what are the different grades? Well, I've made some good maple syrup. I've made some bad maple syrup. Back in the day, there was like grade A, and then there was grade B, and there were some subdivisions in there. Within the last 10 years, some of these grades have been re-refined. So there's golden, amber, dark, and very dark. Are they, is any one better than the other? No, it's what do you like? Okay, what's the flavor? Delicate. Yeah, to me, the flavor is sugar. <laughs> I, let's face it, it is. It's good stuff. Um, but if you have a discriminating palate, great. Delicate, rich, robust, or strong. All right, how much light actually is coming through that? That's how they tell the difference. Part of it is color, part of it is the light that's coming through. Very simple, very straightforward. Uh, you'll see under that there's processing grade, and it's either cloudy, it's off flavor, or there's something else wrong with it. And I really don't know what they use this for. Um, I've heard pipe tobacco uses maple syrup uh, to flavor it, but I don't know for sure. All right. So, you want to do this? You want to make maple syrup? Well, let's talk about some numbers. You're going from a roughly, on average, a 45-gallon drum. Now, that's a 55-gallon drum, but yield of sap to syrup, once you've shrunk all, gotten rid of all that water, is about 45 to 1. Eh, 40 to 1, 50 to 1, give or take. That's a lot. That's a lot of work for not a lot of reward. Okay. On an average year, in an average year, for every tap you put in a tree, you can expect about one quart of finished syrup. On average, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. So that's four half pints, four jelly jars per, per tree, or per tap, excuse me. Again, that's a lot of work. And we're going to get into this, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, silver maple, like I said, that might have a vanilla flavor. Uh, I, I've never had it. I don't know if anybody else has. Okay. Some people are selling organic maple syrup. Again, if you go to Dan's, you look at the maple syrups, and they have several of them. The organic maple syrup actually gets a premium. And I don't know how people can claim organic versus not organic because you're tapping a tree that's grown in the woods. Um, I don't know of any, uh, any maple producers who are spraying for insects or disease. 
So I just kind of scratch my head at that. I have heard of some occasionally fertilizing, but you know that's not an issue uh, being organic or not organic. So I just kind of scratch my head at that one, but uh, some people are using that as a marketing tool and they're getting a premium for it, so good for them. All right, uh, maple sugaring day, that's coming up. Has anybody ever been to this? What did you think? You can adopt a tree. Yeah. They, okay, you can dip your finger in. Uh, yeah, the, the stuff they have to sell there, the, the maple syrup they have to sell, isn't the stuff they make because, well, they don't make a whole lot. Uh, I, the other thing that, that Chad shared with me is how many gallons of sap they collected per year. And, you know, I want to say it's somewhere between 30 and 80. So they get anywhere from one to two gallons, and that's about it. So that's not enough to really sell to the public, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, you can see it in person. Who, yeah. Did you read Little House on the Prairie when you were growing up? Who read the Little House on the Prairie books? Little House in the Big Woods, they had the maple sugaring. What'd they do? They were making sugar, maple syrup, and they'd pour the syrup onto the snow and make some type of taffy, which I've never done. I've always wanted to do that. Um, you got, and I know we have an opportunity now. We got plenty of, we got plenty of snow. Yeah, and it's not going to go away by the time we sugar. The other thing is, now again, my wife Barb is here. I'm going to put her on the spot. Hi. So I took her to my hometown several years ago, and what they had there during the Maple Festival is what they called maple stirs, and they would take just a little plate, about this shallow plate. And they, they had some hot maple syrup. They went up to 237 degrees, I think is what it was. And they pour it in there, and you got a little stick, a little stick spoon, and you stir it. And you stir it. And you stir it. And you're just like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And about four or five minutes later, it took quite a while, it started to turn to maple cream. And it was more of a candy at that point. And then, then she tasted it and went, <laughs> Oh, that's why we're doing this. Can we get another one? And so that was a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun. You can do a lot of good stuff with this. OK. So how much does maple syrup cost? Now, I will come back to this. Here's some things that are at a grocery store. Per gallon, what do these cost? What's, what's the cheapest thing? What's the most expensive thing, do you think? Water's cheap, yeah. What's the most expensive one? Hmm? The most expensive thing is actually the canola oil. Now, I, I, I put this together two years ago, so it's probably even more expensive than that right now. But <laughs> relatively, you can see these differences in prices. So. How much is a gallon of maple syrup? If you bought a whole gallon. Now remember, it go, you're going from 45 gallons of sap down to one gallon of maple syrup. As of two years ago, it was about $65 a gallon. Now this was in my hometown. Um, now I think it's closer to $80 a gallon. Uh, so uh, we bought these pints of syrup over at Dan's. And eight pints to the gallon, ten and a half dollars each. Yeah, that's eighty-four dollars per gallon. If you if you're going with the smaller ones, yeah, that's uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. It's a lot of fun stuff. It is a lot of work. It's a great way to keep teenagers busy, um, keep the kids busy. I think our five-year-old grandson he doesn't have the attention span yet, but it's a good way to keep folks busy. And you know what I, you know why I'm really doing maple syrup this year? Don't tell my wife. It's really a lot about the social aspect. Yeah, I love getting the syrup. It's a lot of fun. But I'm really looking forward to getting the neighbors over and putting them to work and gathering around the fire. And it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun. So, have I convinced you that it's something you want to do? <laughs> I know, it's a hard sell. Um, does anybody have any questions? And then uh, I know Kelsey wants to give like door prizes or stuff. Yep. So yeah, go ahead. I noticed on your one slide on the years that your sugar content went up on uh, the year where you didn't have as long a season. 
Okay, the question was about the sugar content per year. Oh boy, let me go back. And comparing the length of the season with the sugar content. And you um, are you going to get the total amount of sugar? The, the shorter season was higher sugar, the longer season was lower sugar percent wise. Uh, are you going to get the same total amount of sugar per year? And that's a great question. I don't know. I never even noticed that. In 2018, that was the short year, but the sugar content was up. In 2020, it was the long run. That's a good question. I don't know. I do remember, uh, again, working in, in college, that um, the longer seasons, you go later and later, the quality of the sap coming out got lower and lower throughout the course of the season. And I'd say the quality simply because as you get later in the spring, well, you get things like bacteria growing. You get the, the early insects would come out and occasionally get moths in there. And so not only the quality went down, I'm thinking they're eating some of the sugar. So that could be, that could very well be. It's a great question. I'll ask Chad to look into that this year. I saw somebody else, yeah. Spile. Oh. Yep. Um, do you plug that hole and then the following year do you do it in the same spot? Do you do it the opposite? Do you, what do you do? Great question. Okay, so the question was so you got this spile sticking in the tree, this pipe, and you take it out. Now what happens? Do you plug the hole? And the answer is no. Um, and I've done a lot of tree coring for some of my other research, and the research on whether you plug a tree or not is really inconclusive. Sometimes it helped the tree recover, sometimes it didn't. It's really inconclusive. On a healthy tree, it should be able to grow over that hole within one year, at the, at the worst, two years. Because this is a 5 16 inch hole, it's pretty small. A healthy tree should be able to grow over that pretty quick. Uh, what do you do the next year? Do you drill in the same spot? No, you actually go uh, at least, well, about that far, either below or above, and at least that far to the side. Because you don't want to, structurally you are creating a wound, you're creating a, a gap. And so you want the tree to rebuild the structure over that. So I'd go around to the other side, or you know, a third of the way around, the next year a third of the way around, and then you start spacing things out. How far do you drill in? Only about, uh, I'd say an inch and a half. Yeah, it doesn't have to go in very far. Is there a better side of the tree with sun? Um, you know, I don't know. I would think south side, but not necessarily. Uh, I, I would imagine there's research on that. But that said, really, we want to make those taps, uh, put in the taps all the way around, you know, if you're going to do this year after year. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah, Jay. Does the sugar run just inside the bark? Well, it's just, is it further in? or is it further in? Okay. I'm gonna, it's, it's a bit of a long answer, and I'm sorry about that. The vast majority of sap uh, on certain types of trees, like an oak or an ash, the vast majority is in the last two or three rings. 80% or more is in the last two or three rings. And you go maybe, the last 10 to 15 rings and you get the other 10 to 20 percent and everything interior to that there's no sap running. Sugar maples are a little different there might be a little more as you go deeper but but usually not. Uh, it has to do with what's called heartwood versus sapwood. You ever done any woodworking? Yeah okay uh, the sap the heart the heartwood is the heart of the tree and usually it's darker like an oak tree or a cherry, you know, you get a, a cherry cabinets. Uh, it's a very dark wood and there's nothing, there's no conductivity of, of moisture or nutrients inside that heartwood and it's very deep in the tree. It's just the sapwood just under the bark where all the water 
and nutrients are coming up from the ground to the top. So, yeah, it's not very, not very deep. Good question. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much.